So we figured this morning we wanted to just do something really chill, and we're doing uh, what we call uh, our living room arrangement, or our coffee house setup this morning, all right? Still love for you to stand, even though we're too lazy to, to do that this morning. Everybody stand up but us. We have to remain seated to, uh, you know, go with the whole uh, coffee house theme here. We're going to raise our hallelujahs this morning. Hallelujah, as we've talked about before, literally means not just praise the Lord, but it actually is, a, is an admonition to everybody around you. That, hey, praise the Lord with me. Let's do this. Let's praise the Lord together. That's what it means when we say and sing hallelujah. So let's do it. It goes like this. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. My weapon is a melody. And I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. Heaven comes to fight for me. And I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated. The King is alive. That sound good. You could be a little louder. Can you sing louder? <laughs> I, I know you can do it because I've heard you. Let's sing this again. I raise a hallelujah. That's what I'm talking about right there. <laughs> With everything inside of me. That's beautiful. I raise a hallelujah. I will watch the darkness flee. In the middle of the mystery And I raise a hallelujah Fear you lost your hold on me And I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm I raise a hallelujah, I raise a hallelujah, I raise a hallelujah, I raise a hallelujah, I raise a hallelujah. so sing a little louder, repeat that, sing a little louder, yeah, like that. Sing a little louder. 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 It's like choir practice. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. 
sounds like choir practice. Um, you know what I really, what I think that um, Dana in the back loves, who's running lyrics, and we're, we're really, we talk about like not calling it to anybody's attention when we make a mistake, but when I do the song in the wrong order and she's scrambling to keep up with me, I think she just loves that. I think, I, I think I'll keep doing that because it just keeps her sharp. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, man. Um, let's sing this together. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born.
Bible says, um, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. It's so good. I'm going to read it again. <laughs> you might need it as bad as I do. Let's, let's read this together. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. I say this all the time, and I don't know if it makes theological sense, but it still helps me. I say, if we're going to say it, we might as well believe it, right? I say stuff like this all the time. I might as well believe it. I might as well believe God's promises if I'm going to talk about them all the time. So let's, um, let's sing believing this morning that God is who he says he is. Our God is strong. Our God is able. Our God is mighty. Our God is faithful through every storm. This is our song. Our God is strong. Oh, 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 you are close, you are constant in every season. When we are broken, you are the strength you are present in every weakness when we are barren you are the overflow overflow our god is strong our god is able our god is mighty our god is faithful Restore. This is our song. Our God is strong. Oh, 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 let it rise to the heavens from every nation. Praises and anthems making your glory. is strong our God is able our God is mighty our God is faithful through every storm this is our song our God is strong
And our God is able, our God is mighty, our God is faithful through every storm. This is our song, our God is strong. Amen. You guys sound great. I'm going to pray for us, but I really need some water. My mom says, always says she has a throg in her throat. Um, uh, as we continue to go forward this morning, I would just challenge you to, um, to stay in that worshipful state. A lot of times we don't talk about how the, um, the worship service is not, we don't just worship for the first 20 minutes. So I'm going to pray now that as Chris comes, the Lord would just speak through him and that we would continue to worship as we listen just to have our hearts open and to, uh, for my heart this morning and yours to be just a, a fertile ground that the, the Lord can plant, a season that will actually grow. And um, so let's go to the Lord together in prayer. And I can't, I can't tinkle and underscore myself today, Chris, because I have a glass of water and don't know where to put it. Um, Heavenly Father, we're grateful. And uh, we know that um, as Chris comes today, Lord, that you've been speaking his heart. I pray that um, you would continue to work in the lives of all of us to do your will and good pleasure. We trust you and we're thankful for you. Um, I'm thankful for this community of believers and all that we're learning together and all that we are to each other just as we continue to love each other and grow in the Lord together. Um, I pray that you would um, just uh, bring us all back together, those who cannot be with us um, for health reasons. And, and uh, Lord, I'm just thankful that you continue to um, allow us to congregate even in these crazy times. Uh, and again, Lord, we love you and we're grateful. It's in your holy and matchless name that we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. You guys were great. Have a seat. <laughs> Whoops. Is that me feeding back? Okay. <laughs> what is that thing on your leg that you had? I had never seen that before. Tambourine. Tambourine. That was cool. I've, I've never seen you wear that. All right. A little living room worship today. <laughs> In other words, none of the band showed up, so that's what that means. Ah, just kidding. All right. If you have your Bibles, let's go to Genesis chapter 39. And today we're going to talk about what it means to be successful. All right, let's pray. Our Father and our God, we understand that there is no, um, no better place to be than with your people singing about you. You created us in your image. You love us. And because of that love, you gave up your son so that we would be reconciled to you. Father, we thank you for this wonderful gift that we have through faith in Jesus Christ and for the way that just changes life. Father, be with our time this morning. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to show you two pictures. And I want you to tell me which one is a picture of success. All right, here's the first one. Can you see that? It's a very handsome man standing next to a red convertible Jaguar. Right? Next one. The same guy sitting on a scooter. So let me ask you, which one is the picture of success? Is it the one with a red car? Or is it the one on the scooter? I mean, you see a guy standing next to a red car, it's convertible, and it's a Jaguar. What are you thinking immediately? <laughs> Midlife crisis, right? No, you're thinking, wow, that guy really must be, must be wealthy. I mean, he must have it all together. And that guy's successful. Look at that car. 
And then you see a guy on a scooter, and what do you think? What is a guy his age riding a scooter for, right? I mean, what a dork. Who, who rides a scooter like that? Same guy, different vehicle. Isn't it interesting, the difference? What can a car do to somebody's image of success? And that's not how God defines success, not by a car or a house or anything like that. You know, God doesn't define success by how much you own. He defines success by how much he owns you. Big difference. Genesis chapter 39, if you have your Bibles, it's the first book of the Bible, and we're going to look at this entire chapter. And um, one of the things I think we have to remember before we get into, verse, into chapter 39 is that we're not going to study each verse of each chapter going into chapter 50. Our, our, our goal here is to study the life of Joseph and hit the highlights in chapters 37 through 50. So that's what we're going to do. Now remember the context. Remember our cha uh, chapter 37 we were looking at last week. And we found out that Joseph is one of the, uh, next to the youngest of the children. He is the son of Rachel, his father's favorite wife. And so because he had him at an older age, Joseph is his favorite. And his brothers know this. And to remove all doubt, remember Jacob makes Joseph a fancy coat, right? A coat of many colors. And so whenever Joseph wore that coat, his brothers would look at him and they'd go, Ugh. Favorite, spoiled brat. And then to make matters worse, of course, God gives him this dream, a divine revelation, that one day his entire family is going to bow down to him. <laughs> and then he tells his brothers the dream. And they look at him and they go, are you kidding me? You really think that you're going to be in charge over us and we're going to bow down to you? And so not only does he have one dream, he has... Two dreams, which involve also his mother and his father. And so they're a little taken back by this. And so Joseph, uh, Joseph bro brothers are very angry with him. They hate him. They're jealous. So remember last week we found that the brothers were out tending the flock. Jacob sends Joseph to go out and check on him. And so they, they see Joseph coming towards them from a distance wearing his multicolored coat. And what do they say to themselves? This is our opportunity to take him out. We're miles from home. Nobody's going to see us. Let's kill this guy. And they decide, well, you know, that's kind of a waste. Why don't we just sell him, make some money off of him? So there's a caravan going by, and so they sell Joseph to the people in the caravan as a slave, and they make some money. And the caravan heads to Egypt. The caravan is taking Joseph exactly where God wants him to be. The brothers are thinking, hey, we got rid of this jerk. Isn't it awesome now we don't have to deal with him anymore? <laughs> so they think. And they're going to see him again. They take his robe that Jacob made for him. They take some blood from a goat, spill it on the robe, and they take it back to Jacob. And they say, hey, sorry. He got killed by a wild animal. So Jacob goes into mourning. And the brothers think they're done with him, <laughs> and they're not. So now we pick up the story in chapter 39, and we find that J uh, Joseph is now a slave in Egypt. He's in somebody's house. He doesn't know who it is, but he's a slave. And it's interesting what takes place in his life now. And so you may ask yourself, well, what happened to chapter 38? Why aren't, we in, uh, why aren't we looking at chapter 38? Well, it doesn't really deal with Joseph's life directly. It does indirectly. Chapter 38 deals with Joseph's brother, Judah, who gets himself into some trouble. And what Judah does is he involves himself with a Canaanite woman, and things go south very quickly. Of course, God does not want the family of Israel to be involved with foreign women, He's trying to preserve the purity of the bloodline of Israel. And so Judah threatens that. And I think this is one of the reasons why God picks up the, uh, the, the family of Israel and puts them in Egypt because of the danger of living in Canaan and them involving themselves with Canaanite women. 
And so here they are in Egypt. Why Egypt? Because Egypt's not going to mess with Israel. They don't like them. They're, they're, they're kind of low lives to them. And they would never intermingle. So 38, chapter 38 involving Judah, I think is the reason why God picks them up and places them in Egypt. Now, we pick up the story where Joseph is a slave in Potiphar's house. Potiphar is the captain of Pharaoh's bodyguard. So he's a very important person, high up in the government. All right? Verse 39, follow along with me. We're going to read first verses 1 through 6. He says this, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. And he made him overseer over his house and all that he owned, and he put it in his charge. It came about that from the time he made him overseer in his house and over all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned, in the house and in the field. So he left everything he owned in Joseph's charge. And with him there was not, he did not concern himself with anything, anything except the food that he ate. So here he is. He's in, uh, he gets bought by Potiphar, and uh, because he's so successful at what he's doing, Potiphar makes him his, his personal assistant, and he's a slave. Now, God says something very fascinating about Joseph in verse 2. Watch what he says. The Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man. That's an odd statement to make about a slave. Right? Because slave and successful, they don't go together. I mean, no one would ever call a slave successful. I mean, the position that he's taken in life as a slave, well, that's not successful, and nobody would consider it to be successful. And not only is he a slave, but he's been rejected by his entire family. His entire family first wanted to kill him, and they decided, no, we're going to make some money off, so they sold him into slavery. And here he is, away from his family, he's in a foreign land, and he's a slave to somebody else. And it's interesting, verse 2, God calls him successful. There's nothing successful about him. But when it comes to success, as God defines it, has nothing to do with your position. It has everything to do with his presence. Look at the verse again. Verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man. A successful man as a slave, not as prime minister, which will he will become. God calls him successful as a slave. Why? Because of the Lord's presence. What makes you successful? is his presence in your life. Has nothing to do with your position, has nothing to do with your wealth, has nothing to do with what position you hold in your company. When Jesus Christ and his spirit comes to live inside of you to occupy your life, the moment you place your faith in him, his spirit sets up residence. And all through the New Testament, the command is given to us that you, are, you and I are to live by the Spirit, that we are to walk by the Spirit, that we are to be filled with the Spirit, that the presence of the Holy Spirit living inside of us is to take over and fill us, and we are to live by Him. That person, God says, is successful. Now, the world measures success differently than God does. I mean, if, if you have the right house, or if you live in the right neighborhood, and if you drive the right car, and you have all of these markers of success, and people can look at you and go, wow, that guy's got it all together. I mean, that's what people star for, don't they? That's what they live for. 
I drive a nice car because I want people to look at me and go, man, that guy's really got it together. Isn't that true? I have this job and I make this money and really what I want is I want people to look at me and go, wow, awesome. And those are the markers of success and that's how our world defines it. Isn't that true? Now some of you live in my neighborhood. And I don't know if you've noticed, but recently there is a blue Porsche sitting in the entrance. Have every, you guys have seen that blue? Yeah, can you miss that Porsche? It is the prettiest Porsche I've ever seen in my life. It's got like a powder blue. Beautiful. I, I've come to learn since that it's actually Porsche's first electric car, the model. And it, and it goes for upwards around 200 grand. I drive by that thing every day, coveting my brains out after that. <laughs> Beautiful. A woman owns it. And she gets out of that car, what do you think? Wow. Wow. She must be something. Isn't that right? What kind of a job does she have? Whatever job she has made, she must be really, really good at it. Now imagine if you see her climbing out of an old Honda Accord. Would you think the same thing? God looks at a slave who's been rejected by his family, living in a foreign land. He looks at Joseph and he says, that's success. It has nothing to do with his position. It has nothing to do with the car he drives. It has nothing to do with his neighborhood or the house that he lives in. What makes him successful is that God is with him. That makes all the difference in the world. So really, do I really care? What the world thinks about me in regards to success. No. Because I'm not going to stand before the world. I'm going to stand before God. And he says to me, you want to be successful? Walk with me. Live in the spirit of God that I have given you. But along with success comes prosperity. And it's different than success, really. Really. And what we find is that when Joseph, who, uh, who, who, who has the presence of God, God is with him and he becomes successful, the text goes on to say that basically everything Joseph touched turned to gold. Because of that, because God was with him, everything around him prospered. Now let's go back to verse 5. Watch what he says. He says, so it came about that from the time he made him, that is Potiphar made Joseph, overseer in his house, watch what he says, and over all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. So not only is Joseph successful, but because Joseph is in Potiphar's house, what does God do? There's a, there's a spillover effect, isn't there? Yeah, he's living in Potiphar's house, and then all of a sudden, everything starts to flourish. Watch. Made him overseer over his house, all that he owned, uh, back to verse 5, over all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field, even in the field. What does that mean? Maybe he's got some crops. <laughs> and every, everyone's a bumper crop, right? I mean, the corn's growing like crazy. And the green beans are like wild. Straw, oh, it's beautiful. What this guy can grow. Maybe he's got some livestock. And maybe the livestock are, are prolific. Maybe they're mating and they're having all kinds of babies and it's just growing and growing. And thing is, Potiphar recognizes that this is Joseph's doing. Since Joseph comes into the house, he's everything has just gone nuts. How great is that? Have you ever noticed that the more you walk with God, the more things flourish in your life? And that's what he's talking about. Because the presence of God in my life is not only the, 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 what, what makes me successful, but everything prospers. I'm not going to say that your, your, your garden grows better, or, but have you ever noticed that like relationships change? The closer you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ, the more that he owns you, the more that he's filling your life, the important things in life just start to blossom. My marriage. Best thing I can ever do for my marriage is 
to walk with God. My kids, the best thing I can do for my children is to walk with God because God then makes me a better husband. He makes me a better father. And it's all because of the spirit of God who's living inside of me and all this stuff just overflows and life just becomes more prosperous. And I'm not saying you're going to get that promotion you've always wanted. Or, you know, you're going to get a big bank. Maybe you will. I don't know, but I don't think so. If you do, you have to tithe it. Just remember that, right? <laughs> but I think, you know, there's the spillover effect of the presence of God in my life. And, you know, as I, as I live this life and people think, oh, I just want to be a six. You know what? I don't care what position you're in, whether you're a 7-Eleven attendant or you're a check cashier at Walmart or you're a stay-at-home mom or a teacher or a construction worker or you small floors. I don't care what the position is. Walk with God. That's successful. And watch what he does in your life. Everything else prospers. The psalmist says it this way in Psalm 1. Watch. He says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners, take the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. Don't hang out with the wrong people. But whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. The person who does that is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do, what? Prospers. So the more that I walk with God, the more that I'm in his word and I'm walking by the spirit, the effect of that is everything else just begins to prosper. But you know the temptation is, as you think to yourself, well, I really don't occupy an important position in life. You see, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just a lowly housewife or a house mom, or I just mop floors, or, you know, I'm, I, I'm not re- I don't have a, a really important position. It's rather insignificant, actually. So why is it important that I walk with God? And Joseph thinks to himself, here I am a slave. I've been dealt a hand that I certainly don't, it's not fair. I'm not sure what God's doing. You know, walking with God, I mean, I told my brothers about this dream that God gave me. And, you know, here I am, I'm living a godly life, and it doesn't seem like it's paying off for me. I mean, here I am, a slave, and why in the world would I ever walk with God? Because this just doesn't seem to be working for me. You ever been there? You ever think to yourself, you know, where I'm in a situation now, or perhaps I'm unemployed, or God is placed me in a, in a place in life or allowed me to face a time of great uncertainty or, or I, I just don't have what I think, what I need. And, and you begin to think to yourself, well, you know, God must not be paying attention. He doesn't love me. He doesn't care for me. And, and so why in the world would I ever be interested in walking with him when obviously he doesn't care about me? Joseph's attitude is just the opposite. In fact, he is a slave and he walks with God. And it gets worse He's unjustly accused of committing adultery, and he's placed in prison, (laughs) and he doesn't change his step. I mean, he continues to walk with, even in prison, and what's, what's interesting is even in prison, he begins to prosper, and he's in charge of all the slaves, and we'll see that in a minute. Life is not about my position. Wherever I am and whatever I'm doing, it's all about understanding that God's presence lives inside of me and that i got to walk with him and live with him. That's success. It's not your position. And so God has placed him in this situation where he is a slave and, and, and the heat now gets turned up. I mean, the testing really uh, becomes something uh, uh, that's almost unbearable, I think, for Joseph. And, and he passes the test with, wild, with flying colors. Let's go to our text again and let's look at verse, uh, verse 6. He says, now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Joseph was handsome in form and appearance, which means what? He was a stud, wasn't he? He was was handsome and he was jacked. And that gets you into trouble. Watch. It came about after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph and she said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, 
With me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he has put all that he owns in my charge. There's no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you're his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? As, he spoke to, as she spoke to Joseph day after day, but she's persistent, he didn't listen to her to lie beside her or to be with her. Now, it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the household were inside, just the two of them. They're all alone. She caught him by the garment and saying to him, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. And when she saw that he had, he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside, she called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought in a Hebrew to make sport of us. He is, he's come in to lie with me. And I screamed. And when he heard raise my voice and scream, he left his garment beside me and fled and went outside. So she left his garment beside her until his master came home. Then she said to him, with these words, the Hebrew slave you brought to us came into me to make sport of me, and I raised my voice, and I screamed, and he left his garment beside me and fled outside. Ha! Ah! So much for being faithful to God, huh? And so what does, the, what does Potiphar do? Are you going to sleep with my wife? You're done. You're going to prison. So Potiphar sends him off to prison. Boy, his wife is persistent. I mean, she's, she's demanding that he lie with her. And I'm sure that she, he was tempted to do so. I mean, any guy would probably be tempted by that. And he doesn't. And the reason I think he doesn't is because he understands exactly what that would entail. Let's go back. Look at verse... Um, Look at verse 9. He says, There is no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you're his wife. Now watch what he says. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? Why doesn't he say Potiphar there? He's sinning against God, but really, isn't he sinning against Potiphar? If he's going to sleep with his wife... You're sitting against Potiphar. Potiphar's going to punch you in the nose. But it's interesting that Joseph looks at this temptation and he says to himself, how in the world can I do this? How can I do this and, 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 and sin against God? He is the one who, who holds my hand, my life in his hand. He is the one who can change the course of my life in an instant. My life is in his hand. How in the world can I sin against him? Boy, that really changes things when you realize that your sin is against people, yes, but ultimately it's against, it's against God, isn't it? Right? Remember a couple of weeks ago we said that, that, uh, that Christ says to us, hey, listen, you know, if you give a, a cup of water in my name to someone, well, not only are you giving it to them, but you're really doing that to me. Or if you provide them a meal, or if you give them clothes, whatever you do for people, understand, you're doing it to me. The flip side is true as well. If I sin against people, God says, no, no, no. You're sinning against me. Big difference. If you're fighting somebody and you punch them in the face, that's one thing. Then you realize that their father is the incredible Hulk. And he comes to you and says, listen, you hit my kid? You hit me. That makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? This is what God is saying. If you sin, understand you're, you're sinning against, against me. And in a moment, God can change the course of my life. In a moment, God can bring something into my life, discipline, temporal judgment. I don't want that. And I think it's very sobering that, that as you and I live our lives and we face that temptation, oftentimes when there's nobody around, we think to ourselves, well, there's no victim. See, there's no call. I can steal from my company because they pay me 
Garbage. And no one's going to know. There's no victim here. My company can afford this. So I'm going to take this home with me. No one's going to see it. Or I'm going to go to that website. And I know I shouldn't be looking at, but no, no one's going to see me. Right? It's a victimless sin. God says, no. There might be anybody around you. As the text says, Joseph and Potiphar's wife are the only ones in that room. Everybody else had left. No one would have seen it. But God would have. Because his watchful eye is on everything that I do. And I have to be mindful of the fact that whatever I do, I do it to him and I do it before him. That puts sin in a whole different perspective, doesn't it? It's not just against people. It's against him and he will pay for it. Regardless of what I do, before whose eyes I do it, God sees it. It's against him. But he will pay for it through the death of his son, Jesus Christ. Even the stuff that you're saying to yourself, I can do this, and no one's going to say it. Nobody can tell. That sin requires a payment. And that payment put Jesus Christ on the cross. You think, well, it's no big deal. No one's going to... Yeah. They put Jesus Christ on the cross. Not only this, but I think Joseph understands it's against God. His life is in God's hands, but I think also he understands that the success and the prosperity that he's enjoying now because the presence of God is with him would be forfeited. If Joseph goes into that bedroom, he's enjoying the presence of God, and the presence of God is bringing him success and prosperity, if he walks into that bedroom, who is not going with him? God. And if God's not going with him, then what will Joseph forfeit? All that goes along with the presence of God. <laughs> Boy, that's sobering, isn't it? And you think if Joseph had committed this sin, and perhaps nobody would have found out. I wonder how his life would have changed. Because if Joseph isn't faithful in just the little things in his life, will God allow him to assume a higher position? Would he have forfeited the opportunity to be prime minister of Egypt, which is where God wants to take him? But because Joseph is faithful in a situation where nobody was looking, nobody was paying attention, it looked like there was no price tag on this sin, Joseph says, how can I do this and sin against my God? Folks, if that temptation is taking you someplace where God is not going to go with you, don't go. Because you have no idea what you're forfeiting. Moses is not allowed to enter the promised land. You know why? He forfeited that opportunity. Because he's standing there before Israel, and God says to him, speak to that rock and water will come out. What does Moses do? Do you remember? In dramatic fashion, out of anger over the complaining of the Israelites, he takes his rod, and rather than speak to it, he smacks it. And God says to Moses, you know what, Moses? And at the end of Deuteronomy, you know what he does? He takes Moses up on the mountain. And he says, Moses, let me show something. Let me show you the promised land. Look how beautiful it is. Moses, you're not going. I just want you to know that's what you forfeited. And you think, boy, isn't God cruel? No. But folks, it is his presence that that brings success and prosperity to life. And when I walk away from him, I go places where he cannot go, then I forfeit all of that success and all of that prosperity. And even when I do, and all of us do, understand something. The forgiveness of God and the grace of God invites me back onto that path. And the moment that I confess my sin and I ask him for forgiveness, 
he comes back alongside of me and he puts me on that road to the place where he wants to take me. And that's because of the grace of God. Remember, just don't spend your entire life trying to get, impress people, trying to buy the right car, live in the right house, and convince everybody that you got it all together. Who cares, really? You're not going to stand before people. You're going to stand before God. And he is the one who determines success. And his success is, you know something? Just walk with me. I don't care what position you hold in life. Just walk with me. Be filled with the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. And watch what I will do for you. And secondly, don't forfeit any of that. By falling to temptation that you and I face every day, Let's pray. Our Father, we're grateful that you have um, provided for us a life that is abundant. It is prosperous, but not according to the world's definition. It is according to yours. Father, may we be people who so focus whatever position we hold would be to walk with you. Father, and in walking with you, we would know the abundance that comes in the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives. Father, we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing this together. And how great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. All will see how great, how great is our God. And how great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see. How great.